Good morning, folks. There's the GPM. There she goes, taking not only the best measurement tools of global precipitation in history, but our hopes for a better understanding of the extremes, the floods and drought that will be ever more present during the shift in climate. Before we get going today, this video comes from Virginia and the uploader claims that the brightness of the car lights in the video belies the beauty to which his eyes were privy. I can tell you that during my image enhancements I estimate that that meteor could have been 10 to 100 times brighter without the brake lights in your grill. Anywho, we're in the West Pacific. Guam, on alert. But it's not the only place. We actually have two tropical systems developing here. Purple showing the lower pressure of the development. You can see their increased wind power as well relative to the surrounding zones. Shifting the general humidity reveals a dry Australia but come up into the clouds from the surface and the precipitable water remains. Clouds and storms will linger there. Next we go to Europe and Northern Africa. We're now seeing one of the strongest high pressure cells in white, reinforcing the lows in the North Atlantic and Northern Africa. Wind power is strongest at the UK and French coastlines while precipitation is spread down south to the desert. Quickly showing the Unisys temperature map. That coolest circle is negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a sliver of the northern gulf which should have begun seeing frost overnight. But the cold aside, the major story is out west. Counterclockwise driving low exhibits the wind power and moisture drive that we've wanted to see come to the drought zone. Get magenta to the neon green please. Also worth noting that part of the drought zone is now under a flood watch. Now let's quickly look back to mid-November 2013. Zero significant quakes on this planet have hit that area of Baja, Mexico, and Central America. And they really began to taper off months before at the end of hurricane season. In our Saturday audio uploads, we've predicted a return of earthquakes to that area when the storm season returns. Now this is likely too early for that just yet, but with one cell there, flash flood potential, figured I'd put this on your long-term radar. Let's update yesterday's space weather impacts. NASA apparently thinks faster particles in a CME are capable of arriving after slower ones. I happen to think the foremost shock was the coronal hole stream combined with the M-flare CME that we expected first anyway. The remaining shocks, of which I count at least two, were likely part of that glancing blow, the side of the CME from the X-flare. KP6 was the highest predicted geomagnetic instability and we hit right at that level. Unfortunately, I won't call this magnetometer reading an error twice in a row. Our shield is taking far greater micro disruptions than the macro storm levels warrant. Could be part of our 15% weaker magnetosphere. Proton bombardment continues to rise to near level 2 radiation storms at our poles. The latter is shock driven while the initial ramp and chances for more would be due to flaring. We are seeing high seas and a few low M flares but nothing major as the complex sprawler heads for Earth's direct magnetic connection to the sun. Central sunspots have some delta potential with minimal work needed but the umbral cores could use some size. Meanwhile, beasts appear content to wait show off their delta development, but not the bigger flares yet. They will be earth-facing this weekend. Interesting development here is the coronal fields appear to be opening a bit today. The coronal holes below still blocked by umbral fields and not of major power on ISWA. Top watch remains those spots and the plasma filaments on the disk. We may return to storm levels in the wake of the shocks, but not beyond where we've been. Good chance for more M flares today. Earth wind map and shots of our star to close. Eyes open. No fear, it's 6.35 a.m. Eastern Time and that's the news. Be safe, everyone.